If you don't use it, you'll lose it. It's your health. Support for this podcast comes from Charles Schwab. Whatever your unique financial picture looks like, saving for retirement, putting your kids through college, Schwab has the resources and solutions to help. You can learn more at schwab.com. Hey, welcome to the Military Money Show, where I help the military community make, save, and invest money wisely. I'm your host, Lacey Langford, the military money expert. It's not a secret that the more time you have on your side, the more money you can make. Well, to have more time, you need your body and your mind to go the distance. My guest, David E. Frost, is a Navy veteran, NFPT certified master fitness trainer, a rowing coach, and competitor. Since 2012, he's been coaching the baby boomer generation on how to add longevity and vitality to their years. He specializes in nutrition, endurance, and strength training for people who deal with cancer, MS, and diabetes. Dave's also the author of Kaboomer, Thriving and Striving into Your 90s. Utilizing five vital questions, Dave's on a mission to get people to take more steps and less pills. Dave shares advice on how to invest in not just your fiscal bank account, but also your physical bank account. He also gives some tips and resources to help us sleep better and invest in our health. Here is my chat with Dave. Hey, Dave, welcome to the show. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Lacey. It's an honor and a privilege here on the sixth day of Christmas to chat about money. (laughs) Yes, I'm excited because I think this is a great way to kind of get into the new year, get people in the right mindset and be thinking of improving. I love that always to be improving myself in some way, somehow, even if it's a little thing. So I think this is going to be a good topic. I want to kick it off with why should people invest in their physical portfolio or their physical bank portfolio? Why should they do that? Well, it's up to them. Each uh, investor is different, just like every athlete is different. Not to play words, but if I can talk about comparing, contrasting fiscal, F-I-S-C-A-L, and physical with a P, physical bank accounts, I think there are some extraordinary similarities for the time value of things. So if I can start with, we all think about the time value of money. You can't spend what you don't have, generally, (laughs) unless you're really good at credit. So on the fiscal side, there's the time value of money. What is your nest egg doing? How are you doing? What's your risk tolerance? Those kinds of things. But think about your portfolio of the time value of motion. Our federal government offered recently that a human life is worth $10 million. So you and I have a $10 million asset called me. (laughs) And to me, that's a pretty good chunk. When you think the average individual asset is $100,000, multiply that by 100, your portfolio can be $10 million if you live long and live well. So there's that time value aspect of your physical bank. You are a $10 million athlete. And if you take care of yourself, if you challenge your body, my argument is that you may have another 10 years of life and maybe that $10 million is now $12 million. So we're talking about your chart of accounts or your balance sheet where you are capital and your physical capital, your physical 401k is to be honored. It's to be invested in. It's to be monitored. It's all the things of your show, you know, how to invest wisely. I argue you should invest wisely in your physical bank, your body. So that's a starter. I have more comparing contrasts, but thinking about the time value of money. I'll give one more example, if I might. The rule is 72. I'm sure many of your listeners think about the rule of 72 to do a quick guess as to how is my investment doing? How long does it take my money to double? The rule is 72 on Investopedia or other sources. Dave Frost, sometimes Kaboomer coach, says it's the rule of 85. You can continue to grow, thrive, build muscle avoid falls until 85. And that's pretty good. At age 85, the Social Security Administration says I'm dead. (laughs) Actuarial versus physical. I'd like to prove the Social Security Administration wrong, Lacey. I'll be honored to have 85 good years, but if I can offer a tool that I think your listeners might be interested in if they haven't done it, Dr. Thomas Pearl's online calculator, just a very short private tool living to 100. I take it, honest catcher, And I have a pretty good chance of being a blue zone centenarian 
I'm blessed. I have some luck, um, but I work pretty hard in investing in my physical bank. So it's important for people to realize what the long view is for your 401k, but also your physical bank account. If you live to 100, I assume most of your listeners want that money to live as long as you do, or maybe even have something to pass on to your kids and grandkids. So the long view of your physical bank, in my argument, is important. On the business side or, or the financial side, a lot of us know about MBAs. Well, I talk about MBA as mind-body alignment. So fiscal, MBA is to learn how to do money stuff. Mind-body alignment is to how to make that physical bank, your body, last as long as it can doing extraordinary things. What is that bank made up of? What's in the portfolio? You mentioned the S's in your book. Yeah, I'm a simple guy, so maybe it's uh, related to all the days of the week that end in Y, Lacey, but the seven elements in, in the physical bank that I talk about, there's six pluses on your balance sheet and one uh, liability or debit, that's stress. But let me talk about the seven S's, as you mentioned, in Kaboomer. Strength. Strength is the cornerstone. It's uh, documented by many uh, people a lot smarter than me that resistance training is one of the best medicines that anybody can do. Almost anyone, to, regardless of disability, VA rating or whatever, uh, moving stuff to the best of his or her ability is so important. It's motion is good medicine and moving heavy, heavy stuff is one of the best pieces of medicine. So the cornerstone of your and my physical bank is strength, moving stuff, resistance training. Stamina is absolutely the bedrock. We're born to move. We're born to hunt and kill. We're born to hunt or gather. We're born to farm. We're born to be out in nature. Although, you know, over the years, we've evolved to be knowledge workers. Stamina is built by moving. And it takes a long time, as you know, it takes a long time to build your stamina. It can take several seasons or maybe a year or two to make a market increase in your uh, stamina. But that's really what we're talking about, cardiovascular capability, to be able to look at your, <laughs> even at the age of 90, to be able to get excited about you know, what the NASDAQ is doing or what your black swan equity is doing. So stamina, the ability to move for long periods of time is really important. In fact, I call it the bedrock of your physical bank. You can't argue about clean eating as the real currency flow. If you're avoiding inflammation, if you treat your gut well, if you feed the body and keep the flames burning to do amazing things, clean eating is really your currency. A little bit of insurance, accident insurance is stability. We don't want anyone to fall. I'm a Medicare age guy and try care for life and, and so on. One third of all the people my age fall every year past the age of 65. Of course, that's a statistic and some people are blessed, but I would argue you want to be blessed by working on your stability. One of the tests for longevity is standing on one leg with your eyes closed for at least 15 seconds for somebody my age, your young age, maybe 20 seconds, but that's proprioception. That's taking care of your neuromuscular awareness so that you avoid falls. And by the way, your great toe is very important for stability also. So take care of those feet. So that's stability. Stretching is a flexible account. Uh, if you oil up the tin man or the tin woman, you're able to reach, you're able to accommodate, adjust, adapt to life situations. Stretching is the uh, flexible assets in your physical bank. Sustenance, we hit sleep. Sleep is the capstone. It holds it all together, just like the capstone in a Roman aqueduct. If you do not get your restorative, restful sleep, both your deep sleep and your REM sleep, some say seven hours, some get by on less, some need more, whatever it takes so that you can wake up without an alarm clock if you're not on duty or have the forenoon watch. That sleep is absolutely critical. Uh, the chapter in my book is called Mimic Morpheus, where if you do it right, uh, your happy hormones go up, uh, you reduce cortisol, you reduce the hormone flows that increase obesity because that's stress-related. So there are so many positive things from that capstone of restorative sleep. And I think I hit six. So those are on the plus side. That's on the asset side of your, your balance sheet. On the negative side is stress. That's a thief. 
and we don't like crypto fevery, we don't like uh, identity theft, and we don't want anything that takes away from our physical banking. So you really want to guard against stress. You want to learn how to hug. There's a six-letter acronym. I think I'm drawing a blank on the person that came up with this acronym, CELEBS. If you can be carefree like a Hollywood celeb, uh, you're probably going to be avoiding or mitigating stress. So long-winded answer, Lacey, but those are the seven elements of what I consider a physical bank. Six assets, one debit, take care of it, watch your money grow, or in this case, your physical currency grow, and hopefully you'll get another decade of life to live longer and live better. Would you say that reflex is important and does that fall in stability or where does that fall? You know, that's that's kind of one of those ones, Lacey, where I think it's in a systematic way, uh, reflex, because it's neuromuscular, responses to either fight and flight, the four Fs that, you know, are in our, our makeup, uh, feed, fight, flight, and frolic. <laughs> Some people use another F word for the fourth F, but I say frolic. But that response to stimuli is both, I think it's related to stretching and stability, both interrelated. Okay. Yeah. Because I think that's so important to like catch yourself or when you trip, like you can, you know, do some defense mechanism there if you have reflexes. So And be kid-like if I can offer that. You have kiddos. I'm blessed to have adult kiddos now. But if we can be kid-like, another mark of longevity is can you get up from the ground like we used to do in Boy Scout camp or Girl Scout camp without using your hands? Isn't that interesting? That's a pretty simple test. 15 seconds to check your stability and your proprioception by standing on one leg with your eyes closed or get up from the ground without using your hands. That's a reflex. But can you be as reflexive as you were when you were kid-like? Part of our physical banking is to be kid-like, to be enthusiastic, to be resourceful, to be reflexive and responsive. I have to warn you, Dave, I think my parents are going to be really annoyed by you because the next time I see them, I am making them get on the ground and get up without their hands just to test them, just to see where they're at. So they are going to be super annoyed with you. And I'm going to, I'm going to name names. I'm going to be like, Dave Frost told me to check this on you. <laughs> Some people say I'm number one with a certain digit of their hands, but number one means that's important in my mind, <laughs> uh, whether it's fiscal banking or being kid-like. So I'm honored to have your parents <laughs> uh, hate me. <laughs> Coaches sometimes get hated, don't they? Yes. <laughs> It'll be a wonderful activity for them to do with their grandsons. I'll have my boys just go ahead and check them out, see if they can do it. And and I might add a degree of difficulty and not say that I'll say that you said this, but I'll be like, he said, I have to time you as well. <laughs> there you go. You know, part of our nature is to be challenged, right? We're talking to a military audience. The military uh, signs up and where's the fabric of our country to be challenged, to run to the guns if they need to, to do extraordinary things. So it's in our makeup and particularly your audience. It's a special, special subset of the American population. Hey, be challenged, not over challenged. I'm not arguing everybody go out and be a CrossFit uh, Uber athlete because that causes inflammation and injury oftentimes. And as you get older, things get a little more difficult. Emotion is medicine. Yes. I'm going to tell all my military friends, but I'm just checking to see if you can still defend a position and wield a weapon. That's what I need to know. <laughs> That's it. Rig your M14 or whatever the armament is now and hold it and do a deep squat with it. You know. Can you get off the ground? Think boot camp. Yes. <laughs> Think boot camp. Yes. Well, you mentioned eating. What about eating versus exercise? Is it more important to eat right than the exercise or do they go hand in hand? Can you get away with a little less exercise if you're eating right? Lacey, that's an extraordinary question. And, and how much time do no, just <laughs> But there's a saying, and I can't dispute it. Folks like me that are in the business of trying to help people uh, thrive and strive, trainers, uh, certified trainers, master fitness trainers, think we're pretty good at helping people thrive and strive. But I cannot argue with the adage, the road to great abs is through the refrigerator door. <laughs> Clean eating comes before exercise, generally. They go hand in hand, but uh, the diet, to be able to fuel what you do for stamina, resistance, stability, uh, fighting inflammation, fighting COVID with micronutrients and macronutrients, hate to say it because I love motion, diet, number one, numero uno, yeah. diet, clean eating. Well, I ask that question because I feel like the military community, especially us veterans, we know how to exercise. We're not scared of that. I mean, we might not have loved it, but we definitely know what to do. And there's that muscle memory that's there. I mean, I can think, especially my husband in combat arms, like 
he can just jump right back into it so easy versus eating. You know, that might not, when we get out, like maybe we're not focused on it the way that we used to be. And so I think that's really important kind of to make that, you know, both of them should be forefront of your mind, but the eating I could see going away like a runaway train. (laughs) Absolutely. And golly, these times, Lacey, you've heard it, I've heard it, whether it's the COVID-5 or the COVID-15, motion has been a little tougher for most people, combat arms or knowledge workers, Navy wives or whomever. Yet it's not just the weight you put on, it's where you put it on. And if I could bring up two images, we talk about in the military's numbers driven, right? So, you know, height, weight, all those sorts of things. Uh, The images I bring up are fruit, which, of course, fruit is good for you because it's got good fiber and uh, micronutrients. You want to be a pear shaped figure, not like Barbie or Ken, 36, 24, 36. But you want your waist to be smaller than your hip circumference for a thousand healthy reasons. Metabolic syndrome, high blood pressure, subcutaneous fat, all those things. You do not want to be an apple. I know a lot of guys, <laughs> and we used to see it. Now we have, of course, physical readiness tests in the military. But when I started, we didn't have physical readiness tests after uh, indoctrination, plebe summer, or boot camp. And guys were always proud that they wore the same size pants. Well, yeah, but they were down around their hips, <laughs> you know, because their waist was too large. So waist to hip measurement, or, or we used to say waist to butt, but waist to hip measurement is so critical, not BMI. BMI doesn't honor athletes. It doesn't matter if it women and men. Uh, I say throw BMI out and be more concerned about your waist to hip ratio. And what does that deal with? Exercise and diet, diet. Are you eating sugar that ends up in fat if you don't move? If you do, you've got a bad waist to hip ratio. If you eat most great diets, whether it's metabolic or keto or paleo, it's low, simple sugar, low carbs. And that fuels you to do the things you want to do to hunt down your next dinner in the old days or these days, some sort of performance measure, either in, well, certainly in combat, you want to be fueled as well. Uh, But for the activities of daily life, uh, simple sugar is evil. Saving is evil and simple sugar is evil. Back to diet. But yeah, they're interrelated, what you asked about, but so, so important that clean eating to treat your gut well. You know, you have a lot of people here about, should I take probiotics and prebiotics? I've had extraordinary doctors tell me with a good diet, don't be too concerned about buying the latest fat or prebiotic or probiotic. Just eat like your forebearers did and you're probably going to be fine. Treat your gut well and you'll be a better athlete. And then hopefully, again, you'll be able to invest and make good money decisions too, as well as physical decisions. Yes. I think just being well-rounded and understanding the basics of anything is important with money or with your health. So all that's good. You you touched on a little sleep, the importance of it. And this is something that I have been working on. I am a horrible sleeper. I have a hard time going to sleep and staying to sleep. I'm such a light sleeper. Why is it really important to wellness to have good sleep? You know, Lacey, if I may offer one thing, I'm a pretty natural guy. I'm honored that I take no meds uh, and I'm blessed. Some people have to, but I'm honored that I don't need to take meds yet. Sleep is so critical to me. I'm a layman. Sleep is so critical to me that I would say if you cannot get good sleep and if you've done your homework, your due diligence, if you've gone to what the federal government has given us at sleep.org, We pay taxes so that we get resources like sleep.org to pick up simple things like screen time off, relax, don't have a nightcap, don't eat a late dinner, uh, how cool is your bedroom, uh, all those sorts of things. If you try all the hacks from Tim Ferriss in Tools of Titans or uh, read sleep.org, you try everything and you still either have trouble getting to sleep, latency. If you have troubles having deep sleep, which should be about 20% of your evening, if you don't get enough REM sleep when your mind recharges, the deep sleep is for your body recharging, restoring, and recovering from exercise or strain. Uh, The REM is when you charge your, you know, those vivid dreams are recharging all those brains that you have inside your overall brain. It's so important that I would say I would talk to a sleep professional. One third of all the people my age, Lacey, have a sleep disorder. One third. Boomers, 75 million boomers like your folks 
and it's men and women. It's not just men that snore that may have a sleep obstruction or apnea. The women do too. After menopause, the women can have just as much of a sleep disorder as guys can. If I was king, if I was President Biden, I'd say a sleep test for everybody so you understand is something physical keeping you from sleeping well. It's so important, as I say, that I would take an Ambien uh, when I was really stressed and doing some fundraising and so on. Uh, I went to the doc and said, listen, you know, the stress is up, uh, I'm losing weight, all this sort of stuff. He said, I'm going to give you a tiny, tiny prescription of Ambien, cut the pill in half, put it under your tongue and see if it helps. So that was episodic. It did help. I got through my crucible event and I learned that there are times occasionally to ask help of a medical professional if you can't do it on your own. But nominally, seven hours, Lacey, is a rubric for people your age and my age. Kiddos, <laughs> you know, a teenager, a teenager would think 13 hours is right if it's, you know, <laughs> 3 a.m. to noon when they get up to have lunch. But folks our age, nominally seven hours, some get less, some get more. Um, you don't restore, recover, or rebuild from your physical investments. Uh, you don't have a sharp mind for your fiscal investments, and you're just not ready to get up and go to play with the grandkids in my case. Yeah. I really worked on not having any caffeine after 5 p.m., which helped. But also, I started to you know just pay attention, like you said, to your physical surroundings. And I am a light sleeper, so little things wake me up. And it was our motion light outside, like when deer walk by, would set it off. And that would kind of bring me to a wakeful state. So keeping my bathroom door closed, I think, helps with that. So I, I stay asleep and I don't come to that wakeful state. So, yeah, I think paying attention is key. <laughs> well, you're a busy mom, too. And, you're, you, and sometimes, believe it or not, a cool shower or a warm bath are equally as good as helping you downshift to being in a state to get to sleep fairly quickly. Uh, if you're exhausted, you may fall asleep just like that. We used to brag in the Navy that we, you know, we could sleep on metal deck and we could sleep with the gunfire going and all that, or the reindeer on the roof of the aircraft carrier. Actually, it's not good to fall asleep too quickly because it means you're overtired. Yeah. So if you don't have to get up for early morning requirement, if you can get up without an alarm, it's probably a pretty good chance you're rested and ready to have a great I used to say Navy Day, but I'll say any military branch day, if you can get the sleep you need to restore, recover, and clear the mind to be ready to make big decisions. I always tell my husband sleeping is his superpower because he can fall asleep <laughs> so quickly <laughs> and, and just have a, a great night's sleep. So I find that super annoying about him, but it's something I've already said to his face. He knows. <laughs> <laughs> my wife is a light sleeper as well. And, you know, she's gone through her life phase of menopause and all that, hot, cold. So that's a one item that she had to be concerned about was the temperature of the room. And generally, a colder room is better until the morning hours when you want to find a cover. So in her case, temperature is one thing. Another thing, she has a little bit of tinnitus. Many military people do have the ringing in the ears and white noise sometimes help people as well. There are many online offers of nat natural sounds. It could be the surf crashing or, or the forest noise or just white noise to help people maybe get to sleep, whatever it takes, even to the point of seeing a sleep professional to get a prescription drug. Sleep is so important. It's one of the few cases where I say, when you've exhausted natural techniques, get your sleep, whatever it takes. Yeah, I love a noise machine. That is something I have multiple noise machines. I also have white noise apps on my phone for when I travel. So I'm a big fan of those. They definitely help me out. You're getting there. <laughs> We're all work in progress, Lacey. So don't give up on it. It's frustrating. Uh, keep being resourceful. Again, our federal government has done a pretty good job of offering a lot of resources. It sounds like you've already tapped a bunch of them. Sleep.org is a pretty darn good starting point. Well, I had never heard of that before. So I will be sure to put a link in the show notes for everybody so we can all check it out. <laughs> All right. So I want to ask you, I don't want to just this to be talking about it, about people taking action. How can people get started? You know, you're not going to just walk out the door and run a marathon as much as we'd all love that superpower. <laughs> if you've kind of fallen off the wagon with your health or, you know, there's a lot of us that maintain it, but maybe you just want to kick it up a notch. Like how can people get started with it? Wonderful. And this time of year here in the uh, Christmas season and the New Year's resolutions are wonderful, except that 90% of them don't last to Valentine's Day. 
And I think one of the reasons, Lacey, in answer to your question, how do you get started is pick the right brass ring, pick the right goal, look for the small wins, the small successes, the tactical victories. You're not going to defeat Hitler overnight, but you can get your troops to Europe in Eisenhower's case. So uh, one of the arguments with starting is take that first step and make it a small step. Don't plan on the 42K uh, after one week. Be deliberate, do your re research, and look for small successes. When you start building small successes, the glass is half full. It's not half empty. Uh, you're not likely to suffer as many setbacks. Oftentimes when people uh, too much, too fast, too far, too quick, they get hurt and they get frustrated and maybe they don't have help. Or maybe they saw something on YouTube that said they should be better than they are. But somebody on YouTube is 25 years old, not 65 years old. And age is a factor. So small successes, Lacey, is one of the huge ingredients for success. One of the quotes in the book that I offer is uh, by the musician Muddy Waters. And he kind of says, and I'll paraphrase, you can't withdraw what you don't have. If you haven't built up the stamina bank to run a marathon, don't do it. <laughs> Start off small, be comfortable, uh, have the tactical victories, and then look to the big operational and strategic victories in your OODA loop. Uh, so yeah, small successes. Also important is to realize that motivation doesn't do it. Most of our successful habits are based on persistence. They're based on, as Tom Hanks would say, do the work. They're not based on motivation. 43% of our successful habits are ingrained. They're uh, reactionary. They're reflexive, as you mentioned earlier, Lacey. So don't rely on motivation only. It is good to have a workout buddy, a spouse, a club, a group fitness kind of thing in these times. I know that's a lot tougher. Motivation helps. I'm not saying no to motivation, but just know it's persistence over motivation to keep going and look for the small victories. Yes. It always feels good at the end. I always remind myself, it hurts, it sucks when you're in the middle of it, but at the end, it's awesome that you you made that accomplishment or reached the goal. So I totally agree. Can you tell people listening that military spouses, people that maybe aren't military, what OODA loop is? Oh, observe, orient, decide, and then act. I'm sorry. It's kind of a systematic way Colonel Boyd came up with it years ago, and old timers like me still kind of refer to a systematic way to look at a challenge and deal with it. It's not old timers. My brother uses it all the time. So I just want to, so people, so, so, yeah, yes. I think I had to write, observe, orient, decide, and then act. And I would offer one more from a project manager's point of view. You want the feedback loop too. What went well, what didn't go well. Uh, our failures are just as important as our successes for moving ahead. But I still say, look for the small successes first in your OODA loop. <laughs> yes, yes. I love it. Okay. I want to talk for a minute about rowing. You are a rowing champion. I didn't even know that there was rowing competitions. I'm going to be real honest. Where do they do those? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of an unknown sport. It's a zany sport. It's not understood by many Though, in the 1930s, it was the most popular spectator sport in America. That was before NASCAR. That was before the NFL really got going. Intercollegiate rowing was the top spectator sport in America in the golden years. Maybe your grandmother would say, oh, yeah, I remember Cornell against Syracuse or something like that, or Harvard. Rowing is a pushing sport. It is the most intense Olympic sport for kilocalories burned per minute of competition, you use 90% of the muscles in your body, and you also think, which is one of the reasons that the VA uses rowing as an innovative therapy for its TBI and post-traumatic stress of victims that are lucky enough to find a rowing program. I'm honored to be a Freedom Rose coach for those folks in San Diego who use rowing as therapy. The close nature of rowing, the push, the drive, the recovery, the boys in the boat, if you will, relating to that book by Daniel James Brown about teamwork, alchemy, more than self, the life skills. I encourage everybody, I don't get a commission from Daniel James Brown, and I haven't seen the movie, or I guess it's coming out, but there's no finer book about the greatest generation uh, beating Hitler's youth in the Olympics and then beating Hitler's youth on the battlefields of Europe. It's an awesome story. Number two would be the amateurs, by the way, if I could throw in a second one. David Halberstam, God bless him, died in a car accident, uh, but he wrote the amateurs. There isn't a lot of big money. Uh, this isn't LeBron James rowing, <laughs> but it's a sport for your life skills and building that physical bank account. So there are competitions, Lacey, 
uh, indoor and on the water. Right now we're limited on water because of COVID. And yet there is a major competition called the Head of the Charles. Well, I'm sorry, the Head of the Charles had a virtual one in the fall. It's the best day in Boston, even if the Red Sox are playing in the World Series. The Head of the Charles regatta in October in Boston is one of America's great spectacles. But this March, March 7th, I believe, there's a anyone can join a virtual 2,000 uh, meter competition called the Crash Bees. And Crash B starts for the Charles River Association of has <laughs> And it's considered the a national championship for indoor rowing. They're uh, para-athletes. They're, I think the oldest competitor was 94, but they're high schoolers. It's an American spectacle and is helped publicize in, in different ways than CrossFit because indoor rowing is one of the events in CrossFit competitions because of its gnarly nature. But yet it is such a great whole body sport. It's effort based. You can eat a big meal and still do well because you're not box jumping or doing crazy high impact things. If you can get up from a chair, you can row. If you're a 90 year old and you can get up from a chair, you can row. In a double skull, I was honored to work with a triple amputee because we have adaptive equipment so that 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 athlete, a military athlete, could get out and enjoy time on the water, which is pretty cool. I know that your service time was not on the water, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we have equipment in rowing now to help almost anybody sit down and go backwards and have a good time. I've never rowed on the water. I was exposed to rowing through CrossFit, which I really got into Every time my husband deployed, I always made a commitment to learn something or do something new. And one year it was CrossFit. And, but I really loved rowing. And what you said about it, the repetitive, it's almost methodic. It really relaxes me in addition to getting the exercise. So that was a gift that my husband bought me one time was an indoor rower, which I love. And the thing I'm most protective of keeping like clean in our workout area. <laughs> So. <laughs> it doesn't make a very good Christmas tree, does it? Up on its end, you can decorate it, but it still looks like a rowing machine. <laughs> yes. Well, I have a fitted sheet. I keep it nice and tight around it because I want it to be it's one of my prized possessions. <laughs> so, Well, kudos to your husband and kudos to all the ladies that row. There's some extraordinary, anyone can be extraordinary by putting in the time. It's a volume sport. And I think that's one of the messages you often share with your listeners about the money matters. But as far as physical matters, you got to put in the time. Uh, and rowing is a volume sport that it will help with that stamina, which is the bedrock of your physical bank. And by the way, if your tops get a little tight and your, your leggings and pants get a little loose at the waist, that's okay too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As, as long as you're healthy, I think that's what's important. That's well, right. I also think just another thing that has been now on my mind and another thing my parents are going to be annoyed with you is that I'm going to get my parents to try out my rower. I don't think I've ever told my parents that they should try out the rower, but now I'm going to make them get up off the floor with no hands and get on the rower. So they're, you know, happy new year to them. They're going to be annoyed. <laughs> there you are. Safety first, but I love to annoy people if it's doing good things. So <laughs> wonderful. Well, can you give anybody that's listening, that's thinking about working on their health and in increasing their portfolio, that bank that you're talking about, the strength, the stability, Anything, if they're nervous about starting, maybe they are seriously overweight or just not in a good mindset, just one thing, piece of advice to kickstart them. Sure. Again, first they should look in the mirror and honor that athlete that he or she sees in the mirror, no matter what age, no matter what body mass. Bill Bowerman, the, uh, the inventor of the Nike waffle trainer, said, or asked, are you an athlete? And he answered rhetorically, everyone's an athlete. So my first suggestion is look in the mirror, celebrate that athlete that I see and say, OK, I may not, you know, I may not be Rafer Johnson. God rest his soul. He just passed away. An amazing athlete, a decathlete, Rafer Johnson. I may not be Rafer Johnson, but I don't have to be. I just need to be the best athlete I can be if I want to invest in my physical bank, if I want to thrive and strive into my 90s. So number one, honor the athlete. Number two, if you don't feel comfortable understanding the precepts and your own limitations. Many of us have gotten ding from a bicycle accident, a fall, a broken bone, a little neuro, a neuromuscular issue. Seek professional help if you can afford it. And we're blessed. Many of us in the military ecosystem are able to get reasonably affordable professional help 
again, muddy water said you can't draw from the bank what you haven't put in. And if your body isn't ready to be drawn on, figure it out so that you know what your withdrawal plan is for your balance sheet. So celebrate. Number two, seek professional help if you can afford it and if you're unsure as to what your capabilities could be. Number three, be patient. Any good thing in wellness and fitness takes time. Nothing is instantaneous, no matter what you read on the internet or <laughs> whatever Madison Avenue provides us. I'll give a couple examples. Every physical bank, the parts of your portfolio have different maturations. The quickest thing, Lacey, to improve in our physical bank is our stability. If you spent two weeks on standing with your eyes closed or doing other stability moves, asymmetric or unbalanced moves, you would improve drastically. You would be more kid-like in two weeks. Take it to the extreme stamina. You might take a year or two to dramatically lower your resting heart rate, extend the distance you can move, or perhaps the speed at which you can do it. It takes time. You have to change in a very positive way your cardiorespiratory and cardiovascular system. That takes time. Strength is interesting. Even old timers at the age of 80 can notably, notably improve their leg strength to keep from falling in 8 to 12 weeks. So we're talking about a few weeks or perhaps a few years for your physical bank. But when you're talking about a lifetime, it doesn't seem so bad. And like you said, it may hurt a little. If I could offer, if it hurts, stop, yeah, yeah. <laughs> unless you're really competing. But discomfort is feedback. Pain is okay as long as it's not radical or chronic. It's feedback to your body that maybe we need to adjust or maybe that's enough for today. So number three is patience. I would say those are the three. Celebrate, acknowledge it's going to take time, and know that there's an athlete in you that you will make progress but don't rely on motivation. Even though a workout buddy, a spouse, a club can help you, it's got to become, as you said, muscle memory. It's got to become a persistent habit, knowing the return on your invested capital is significant. When I start first marathoning years ago, you know, I was on shore duty with the Navy and I said, well, I've heard about it. this was the running craze, the gym fix runners craze. And this is in the late 70s, early 80s. I said, I'm going to run a marathon. That sounds pretty cool. Actually, it wasn't pretty cool. I didn't train for the first couple. I didn't train well enough and it hurt. And uh, I said, well, this isn't really fun. So maybe if I learn how to train well, I can perform better. It was my 13th marathon when I finally broke three hours. Wow. It took 13 for me to learn how to build the stamina and have the mindset to persevere through the, the wall at 19 or 20 miles. And for me, the quality of the journey was important to learn in my younger day. So it takes time, but it's worth it. It's worth it. You're talking about 10 years of your life. Back then, I had people tell me you're working out too hard. They say you only get two years of added longevity if you work out. And, and you just spent two years running or you invested two years of your life exercising to gain two years on the balance seat. That's a big zero. And I said, that doesn't feel right. And oh, by the way, even if that's true, the quality of my life improved because I sleep better, I eat better, I have more enthusiasm, that kind of stuff. Now, all the studies about telomeres, Younger Next Year was a great work about a decade ago, which said that people can build muscle into their 80s. Now, folks are saying with Gero Protection Program, you can add 10 years to your life. And my goal is to make the Social Security Administration wrong. <laughs> Actuary says, Dave, you're dead at 85. Might be, but I'd like to say, if my ears are good, I want to live to 100. You know, So it's worth the investment. It's return on invested capital. Hopefully it doesn't hurt too much unless you're really going for it in an Uber competition. You sound pretty competitive. <laughs> I am. If we play foosball, you'll find out. I'm just joking. <laughs> well, that's really great advice for people getting started. I want to ask you a couple of quick random questions. I ask everybody first, what is one resource or tool that you use that makes your life easier? <laughs> a towel. I'm a sweat hog. <laughs> and one of my messages is motion is medicine and motion to sweat is what starts to generate the positive cytokine storms, Lacey. So as simple as it sounds, and I, I would like folks to know that it doesn't have to be expensive to move to sweat and stay fit. 
Yes, a rowing machine costs about $800, but you can get one used and it lasts for 20 years. That's a pretty good return on invested capital. So I say a towel, which might cost, what, a couple bucks that you can use for a long time to mop your brow. I would like you to move to sweat at least three hours a week, every week, the rest of your life. And I think a towel is the best tool ever. Yeah, there's smart watches and smartphone apps and great books. Grab a towel, move. Love it. Okay, what's your favorite book right now or your favorite book of all time? And you can't say your book because I'm already going to list your book. (laughs) I'd have to say, Lacey, that when, W-H-E-N, my New Jersey accent there, when by Daniel Pink is, for what we're talking about today, is my favorite book. The subtitle is Scientific Secrets of Perfect Timing. So when you make big financial decisions, uh, if you look at Jeff Bezos, he holds his key meetings before lunch. People get tired after lunch. Daniel Pink talks about it's okay to nap and how to nap effectively. He calls it nappuccino. If you don't know what a nappuccino is, uh, Dr. Google, nappuccino. Works for me. I hope it works for your listeners. Uh, When you work out and how you work out, some people are interested in intermittent fasting. I would not recommend you go for a personal record after intermittent fasting, but I would say that a steady state piece of work will help you help your energy systems burn fat, which a lot of us are interested in at middle age and our encore years. So uh, When by Daniel Pink. The reason I like Pink, and maybe that's one of the reasons I gravitated to When, other than he talks about when to weight lift and when you get personal records in the Olympics and other things. He is very big on soft skills and emotional intelligence. And uh, I'm sure most of your listeners have autonomy, mastery, and purpose. But Daniel Pink, it's a color, um, but he's also a pretty provocative author. So when, scientific secrets of perfect timing. Wonderful. I will be sure to put a link to that in the show notes for everybody. That sounds like a really good book I'd be interested in reading. Now it is time for my favorite part of the podcast, which is game time. And today we're going to be playing Would You Rather?, So I'm going to give you some examples of things, and you have to tell me which one you would rather do. Are you ready? Okay, fair enough. Go ahead. (laughs) Some of these I'm going to reuse because I love them. Would you rather have a flying carpet or a car that can drive underwater? Oh, Navy guy, car that can drive underwater. (laughs) Yes, yes. (laughs) Ship driver. I'm sorry, the flyboys, you know, the aviators, the men and women, aviators, flying carpet. For me, underwater. Yeah. I should have thought about that before I asked a Navy guy that question. (laughs) Okay. Would you rather the aliens that make first contact be robotic or organic? Robotic. Okay. (laughs) All right. Would you rather be born again in a totally different life or born again with all the knowledge that you have now? I'd have to go with the latter, Lacey. Uh, I joke, you know, kindergarten, cop or whatever. I'd love to go to college now because, boy, I'd be a whole lot smarter and a whole lot in many ways. So I'd take the latter where I'd love a do-over. You know, I wouldn't call my life a false start. I'm blessed. It's been a great life so far. But, you know, a do-over, life's lessons that I picked up from many extraordinary rabbis and coaches. I'd like to do this one again and do it better if I could. Yes, I like that answer. I think I would have chose the same. Well, I appreciate you playing game time and being on the show. Can you tell everybody listening where they can learn more about you and what you're up to? Well, (laughs) I started blogging years ago to journal my own uh, journey in physical banking. So it's well past 40, and that's spelled F-O-R-T-Y, so no hyphens or dashes, wellpast40.com. I built on those blogs in my teaching experience. I thought I had a book in me. I'm lucky enough to have the name Frost, and I'm a shirt sleeve relative of Robert Frost. And my middle name is Emerson. And I love Ralph Waldo Emerson because he talked about the felicities of age. And here I am in my encore years. Thank you, taxpayers, among your uh, listeners who are taxpayers, because you're paying for my Medicare and my Social Security. But Emerson talked about the felicities of age. So I got to thinking, well, there's these two authors, one a poet and one a prolific writer, Harvard guy. And I said, maybe there's a book in me. I'm an independent author. I wrote a book and launched it at the start of the pandemic. It's called Kaboomer, Thriving and Striving into Your 90s. And it's an almanac-like look at the tips, tricks, and hacks to try to help people live longer and live better. And it's a a little bit of Boomer in there. My musical references are from the 70s and 80s. 
and it's experiential. I don't offer something if it isn't credible and if I haven't tried it myself. So I would love other people to thrive and strive to do their best to live long and live well. And my Kaboomer book in audiobook, in Kindle or Nook or paperback is there to be used. It should be dog-eared. Sir Bacon said that some books are to be digested thoroughly. Kaboomer is the type of book that should be digested thoroughly and used. Dog-eared, highlighted, uh, referenced. It's a working almanac for hopefully some things to make life better and easier for folks of all ages, but particularly the Medicare age people. So that's the book. I'm online. And if I may, as a (laughs) political service announcement, I'm so amazed at what our men and women, our first responders in uniform and the healthcare workers do every day. If anyone out there is a disabled veteran or um, might not be able to afford a book, uh, send an email to Dave at wellpass40.com with your mailing address, and I'll make sure you get a copy of Kaboomer. It's my expression of gratitude. When uh, my colleagues that have COVID, I hear that, I send them a copy as hopefully a get well read. But to your many listeners that are a little banged up or a lot banged up, if I can say thank you so much. And if a little book is an expression of gratitude to make me feel good, that's great. But hopefully it would make you feel good building your physical bank, too. So if that fits, I'd be honored to do that. All I need is a mailing address uh, and I'll send a copy. Wonderful. I will put a link to all of that in the show notes, your book and the website and your email. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Dave. I appreciate it. Lacey, thank you. Thanks to Dave for coming on the show to discuss investing in your health. Thank you to Charles Schwab for the work they do to help the military community achieve better financial outcomes and for supporting the Military Money Show. You can learn more at schwab.com. Please head over to LaceyLangford.com to get all the show notes and resources. I appreciate you listening, and I will talk to you next week.